I think, you know, some would say that one of the hearts of Aaron's worldview was this idea uh, to oversimplify that information wants to be free, yeah. right? And that's something that he took very, very, very seriously. Yes, although I think sometimes that's overstated. I think a lot of people look at Aaron and think all information wants to be free, everything that's online should be free, uh, there should be you know, access to every, everything. And, and I don't really see him that way. Aaron wanted to work within the system, it seemed to me, to hack it kind of in the best sense. You know, here's a problem, how do we fix it? Here's a system, you know, if that system's broken, how do we engineer the system so that it works better? <music> Hi, I'm Raihan Salam. I'm joined today by Brian Knappenberger, the director of the Internet's Own Boy. You know, it's easy sometimes to feel like you're powerless, like when you come out in the streets and you march and you yell and nobody hears you. But I'm here to tell you today, you are powerful. You can stop this bill. A co-founder of the social news and entertainment website Reddit has been found dead. Aaron learned how to learn at a very young age. Bob introduced him to computers, and he just took off. He certainly was a prodigy, although he never kind of thought of himself like that. He really had different aspirations for the purposes of political goals. He was sort of learning to hack politics. Stop SOPA! This bill poses a serious threat for all who use the internet. The freedoms our country had been built on would be suddenly deleted. I couldn't let that happen. Aaron was trying to make the world work. He was trying to fix it. Bringing public access to the public domain. He doesn't hack JSTOR in the traditional sense of hacking. He wasn't stealing, he was making a point. They arrested him, strip searched him, and left him in solitary confinement. He said they want to make an example out of me. On the internet, everybody has a license to speak. It's a question of who gets heard. Aaron Schwartz was not a criminal. And say, oh, this is another instance of cyber war. The cyber criminals are attacking us again. They use those as excuses to push through more and more dangerous laws. This is a poor use of prosecutorial discretion. Should have never gotten the attention of the criminal system. We need to galvanize opposition today because today is when it matters. I'm still angry. This is what we as a people think is okay. Aaron was willing to put himself at risk for the causes that he believed in. He was the Internet's own boy, and the old world killed him. Brian, thanks very much for joining me. Thanks a lot for having me. So, Brian, who was Aaron Swartz, and why were you so taken by him that mm. you made an entire film devoted a pretty good chunk of your adult life <laughs> to telling a story? Uh, well, it's a good question. A Aaron was, um, he was a, a kind of child prodigy, programming prodigy. Um, uh, took to computers at a very, very young age and was really, really good at it. But, you know, a couple of notable things in his early life. At the age of 12, he became part of the RSS working group, um, you know, a group of people that were setting standards for RSS. He was a, um, a significant contributor, sometimes uh, kind of ar arguing about, about how the, the future internet should go. And uh, people realized in these kind of online discussions that this, we're talking to a 13-year-old kid. Immediately, he kind of uh, burst onto the scene, and he, be, he became a con you know a contributor. He, he was also um, a technical architect of Creative Commons, and uh, one of the co-founders of Reddit. And when Reddit uh, sold, uh, the group of three of them sold Reddit to Condé Nast. They made a lot of money, and he became a very rich 19-year-old. Um, and from there, he took a pretty decisive turn towards um, social. Uh, uh, social action, social justice, uh, social organizing for, for around causes, and that's, that kind of defined um, the rest of his life. And then he got in trouble, uh, got arrested for downloading 4.7 million academic journal articles from the online service JSTOR, um, which started a two-year legal nightmare for him that left him uh, emotionally and financially exhausted, and he ultimately took his own life uh, at the age of 26. When did you first encounter him? My previous film was called uh, We Are Legion, the story of the hacktivists. It was in very much the same territory. Certainly, I was kind of clued into people that were being arrested in, in this kind and of space. And you knew who Aaron was. You had encountered him. And I knew him, him yeah. yeah. And, and it was a striking story to me, even, even when I had first heard that, that, this, um, uh, that this young man had gotten, you know, 
arrested for, um, for, for entering this closet at MIT. What was also um, odd is that nobody else was following this case, as opposed to some of the other kind of very high profile hacker cases. I mean, we, you know, some of these cases are well talked about in the media. Um, his wasn't. I learned when I was making the film that that was partly because he was actively trying to uh, to keep his case quiet. He didn't want to incriminate his friends. He didn't want to anger the prosecutor um, that turned out to be very, very aggressive. Um, and so he was actively trying, while, while he was often in the media, he was very rarely talking about his legal issues. And so most people didn't really know about his case until um, uh, until he took his own life. And then there was this kind of wave of frustration and anger that came out. So Aaron was obviously a very technically gifted guy, but it seems that he's become something something much larger than that. I mean, yeah. he, he was part of a set of causes that are not very well understood. And tell us a little bit about the causes most dear to him. I mean, he's certainly very closely associated with this idea of a free culture, for example. That was yeah. one thing that he was he took very seriously. But talk to us a little bit about you know why um, his work had so much resonance, at least within this world of people who do follow. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's interesting because I think one of the things that really made Aaron unique was this kind. Kind of, he, he had this kind of technical mastery on the one side, but he also had a, a, a really a, a very serious, you know, significant command of these this, um, these bigger issues, right? Whether they were social justice or they were internet freedom, kind of free culture issues, he he sort of ha he sort of understood both both sides of it. You don't find often find people who are so technically gifted that can also explain those technical things. He clearly. had an intense sense of justice. I mean, yeah. to to the point where uh, people often found him. You know, quite difficult, yeah. right? I mean, sort of. He was he was very serious about it. He took these yeah. things, uh, you know, he treated these abstract matters like they were matters of life and death. Yeah. They shaped his personal relationships. I mean, where did that come from? Was it was his family like that? Was that something? That I think uh, my impression of his family is that they did have these kind of intense discussions. That they did um, sort of care deeply about this stuff. That this was a part of what they just talked about at the dinner table. And and it and it does very much come that kind of uh, intensity does come from his family. I, I he was also kind of a, a bit of a loner, you you know, in the film, you explore this brief period when mm -hmm. he went to Stanford. You know, yeah. typical thing for a super bright kid to yeah. go and do that. And you know, a lot of super bright kids like that will find a you know a universe of friends and other people to work with yeah. and to befriend. But he didn't take to it. Yeah, yeah. He, he and before that, he even dropped out of high school. It was too too simple for him. He, he just thought the, the homework was ridiculous and and uh, a bunch of busy work, all designed to kind of pen students together and. Um, and, you know, it certainly wasn't the kind of things he was interested in learning, and he was very much interested in learning. It's an interesting thing about Aaron, is that he, he, was, he isolated himself sometimes. He was uh, kind of a loner, as you, as you said, um, but he also appeared on uh, television and, and, and made these kind of public appearances and made this kind of rousing kind of public support for uh, against SOPA. Um, the Stop, so, Online, the Stop Online Piracy Act. So, um, here, yeah, you have this person that's really both things. That, that this guy was both seem... a loner and a leader. I mean, you, yeah, you, exactly. it seems that yeah. there are so many people who looked up to him, I mean, who are uh, kind of a, a central part of your film. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more, just dig in a little bit more about what he accomplished in his short life. Well, that's one of the things that kind of surprised me about Aaron is the number of things that he accomplished during his life. Um, there's a point in the film where we actually... It helps that he started to learn how to read when he was three. Yeah. <laughs> you had a head start on the rest of us. Right, right. And, and there was a year that he, he um, I, I think he uh, reviewed a hundred books on his blog in one year. He's obviously a voracious reader and, and, you know, significant reviews. The sheer volume of work that he did in his relatively short life. And so there's a point in the film um, where we list all of his kind of accomplishments, all of the companies that he was involved with or started, um, all of the kind of organizations that he con in which he contributed some something, some kind of technical uh, expertise, and uh, it's it's not even meant to be read. In the I mean, the list is so long. We just kind of the point is to show how many, not not individual. One. So it was really striking how many things that he was he, he had interests in. One thing he contributed to quite a bit was Creative Commons. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about that? One way to look at Creative Commons is that it's a kind of an attempt to chart a kind of reasonable path through a chaotic world where on the one side you have uh, content providers that have traditionally uh, copyrighted their material and locked it down and sued anybody that, that, that tried to copy it. And on the other hand, you had this growth of the internet, um, which, which brought with it uh, piracy and the Pirate Bay and, and, and Napster and all this stuff that, that sort of challenged this kind of traditional model. 
co uh, Creative Commons was a kind of uh, an attempt to make sense of that world. It may not be a perfect attempt, but it's one of the only attempts, I think, that's in which <clears throat> A content creator can decide the kinds of licenses or freedoms they want their work to carry. So if you have no problem with people sharing this thing that you've produced in the world, yeah. you can explicitly say that, you know, yeah. embedded in the copyright. Embedded in the, in the work itself, yeah. right. And so you're choosing different things. Do I want it to be commercial, non-commercial? You know, if someone shares my work, uh, I can say, well, I, you can share it and you maybe even can make a derivative of it. Or, um, but you have to give me credit, let's but say. But you have or, to give yeah. me credit. Uh, that's another choice yeah. in, in these kind of series of licenses. Um, you can, I mean, if, you, if it was full Creative Commons, then of course you, could, you could share my work and even sell it. Um, but of course, uh, it was also an attempt to say, for, for content providers to actually make money and say, well, you know, maybe some of this money goes back to the artists. So uh, if you share it, then it's not a commercial use so of that So why did this so, matter so much to Aaron? Well, I think it mattered because, you know, Larry Lessig is the main, is a sort of the head of, of this, and he appears in the film. Aaron's role in that was the technical part, right? Because if you think about that as a concept, that's really a set of lawyer releases, really. That's really a set of kind of... Yeah, it sounds, it sounds fairly unromantic <coughs> in itself. Yeah. And then, but you need to be able to attach those, those set of freedoms to the work itself, to the image, to the drawing, to the uh, film. Um, and, and so that was Aaron's job, to architect how do you, how do you make the lawyers and the machines <laughs> work together. And, and so that was the part that, it was a significant part. Yeah. So I, I bring up Creative Commons because I think, you know, some would say that one of the hearts of Aaron's worldview was this idea uh, to oversimplify that information wants to be free, yeah. right? Um, and that's something that he took very, very, very seriously. Yes, although I think sometimes that's overstated. He, okay. he, he, um, I think a lot of people look at Aaron and think, and think all information wants to be free, everything that's online should be free, uh, there should be you know, access to every, everything. And, and I don't really see him that way. I, I think that you know, Creative Commons is a very reasonable approach mm -hmm. to a chaotic world. It's trying to give people more tools it's with trying which to give to manage, people. Yeah. It's trying to make some sense of this chaos and, and very kind of contentious chaos between, um, between content uh, creators uh, and traditionally things like movie studios and record recording industry and all that and, and the people who are trying to kind of share. You know, this, this, this has become people going to jail for this. Absolutely. So, um, so this was an attempt to kind of dis we, you know, find a reasonable path through that. So I actually don't think he was as, as extreme as a lot of people kind of paint him, paint him to be. Um, you know, he was, you know, he seemed to me to be wanting to work largely within the system most of the time. I mean, I had just come off a film, We Are Legion, The Story of the, Hact yeah. the Hacktivist, um, which was about anonymous, right? And, and I, of course, as you can imagine, knew lots of people who just wanted to burn the, burn the system down and start over. Um, that was not Aaron. Aaron wanted to work within the system, it seemed to me, to hack it kind of in the best sense, to manipulate social systems so that they Is could... that because he saw the virtue of these systems, or you know, is it just a, was it more of a strategic choice, or what do you think that came from? Just a natural pragmatism that comes from his technical background? Or? It's an interesting question. I think it's an engineering mentality. You know, here's a problem. How do we fix it? Here's a system. You know, if that system's broken, how do we engineer the system so that it works better for us? See, the funny thing is that when you think about an engineering mentality, it can either be this hyper rationalistic mentality of let's burn it down mm -hmm. and build a purer, better system, or it could be. You know, the, the opposition is too powerful, you know, let's figure out a hack. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's interesting. Exactly. It can mean many different things. So that engineering mentality may be one of the things that in, in some ways got him into trouble. If you think about your approach as an engineer, right, you see, well, what's, where is this, this, how does this system work? Where are the inefficiencies? Where's the friction? Where are the things that aren't working or could work better? And you look at it, you know, if it was a, a mechanical, if it was mechanical, you just look at it and you'd fix those things. You'd make it less friction. Right. You'd make it work better. Yeah, it's definitely not but a political mentality. When you're de dealing with yeah. human systems, you may be able to identify where there's um, inefficiencies or corruption. That's a great thing, but you're actually also dealing with humans that may want to hang on to that corruption right. or may want to hang on to that power. Uh, or may have a vested interest in the way the system works. So that meant engineering mentality may be part of what didn't make sense to him. Why, if, if this is broken, why not fix it, right? Well, he ran up against real world uh, entrenched power. 
you begin the film with uh, a quote uh, that I found very apposite. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a bit about it. Yeah, we start the film with the uh, Henry David Thoreau line, which I think is, is really a, a question that any activist ultimately comes to. Um, a, a very simple sort of statement, uh, the, the Thoreau line is, unjust laws exist. Um, should we be content to obey them? Should we seek to change them and obey them until they're changed? Or should we transgress them at once? And that's a, that, that is a choice I think that any activist comes to. Do you, do you, are you okay with the status quo, uh, even if you see, think it's wrong and it's unjust? Uh, do you try to change it and work within the system? Or do you just actively try to, um, to break those laws? And this is, this is, of course, in the famous civil disobedience. So the Thoreau quote struck me as a very good fit because Aaron yeah. is a guy who was absolutely uh, a political activist. He was working uh, even in terms of you know, campaigns and elections. I mean, he was really throwing himself into a ton of stuff, into working through the process. Mm -hmm. But when he confronted JSTOR, Mm -hmm. And the fact that, you know, here is a database that charges people enormous amounts of money to access information, it seems like it offended him in a very visceral way. Absolutely. So what is JSTOR? Uh, JSTOR is a kind of repository of academic journal articles. Um, it uh, has a whole history. It's one of many people in this field, in many companies, corporations in this field. Um, that basically takes um, what is sometimes a taxpayer-funded um, research and gets the copyright from, from the, uh, you know, the, the researcher and the, or the institution that created it and then um, and houses it on this on kind of online database in which you then go and pay more for these things. So literally research that is funded by taxpayers yeah. is not research that I can access for free. Right. Got it. That's the contention. That's and, the problem. And That's the heart of the problem. And my understanding is that you know this research, the idea is that it's supposed to propagate. It's supposed to spread. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. people are supposed to learn from it. Other researchers are supposed to be able to you know build on that research. I mean, yeah. That's the whole idea, right? Right, right. Well, right. So you go, if you go to JSTOR, these things cost a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, 50, 60, 70 bucks for for a single article. For a single uh, article. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. if you want to access you know the whole universe, I mean, that's going to be quite a Quite a bit more expensive. It's almost impossible. And also, so that, so that, and, and, and the original researchers don't get any of that money, right? And they want their work to be, I mean, if you're a researcher, you want your work to be disseminated as widely as possible. You want it to be cited in other people's uh, journals. That's how, you know. The, the, but JSTOR will say, well, actually, we need money to run this whole system, right? Right. right. And I think that's, that was probably true in the very early days, in the 90s. Right, that that they needed that, but at this point, it's the amount of, and this is true with with all of these, and not just J. J. Store is not actually the worst offender here, but um, but uh, it's true. It's that, that's the argument that they need it in order to run the database, but their operating costs are so low compared to the yeah. amount of money that they make, and I mean they're making. And so was this something that Aaron was just? Did he? Was this something he talked to his friends about? Was this something that just really pissed him off? Yeah, I mean, I think one time he there's a there's a uh, story that we recount in the film where he was at a conference in Europe and he asked uh, somebody from JSTOR how much would it take to buy all the articles and uh, release them online for free, and the answer was something like two hundred million dollars, <laughs> right? And he just thought that was outrageous. He thought that was absolutely outrageous. So, so here, so Aaron from was his perspective, literally thinking about, well, gosh, is there some solution where I can work with JSTOR yeah. and just, yeah, 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 yeah. So, tell us exactly what he stands, what he was accused of doing, what he did. Yeah. So essentially, what he uh, was accused of doing was downloading 4.7 million academic journal articles from JSTOR. And how did he do it? And so he did it through the MIT network, which is um, an open, famously kind of open. Uh, famously fast network um, in which you could go, you don't have to be an MIT student, you could just go on the campus and, and access it. Um, MIT has access to JSTOR, right? So through that connection, that fast connection and clear access, um, he downloaded 4.7 million academic journal articles, right? How much time did it take? It, it, a period of over a few months. 
So he was just very systematically yeah, himself. Yeah, exactly. Going day in, day out, just doing that. Yeah. Well, not every day, but yeah. but yeah, there's there's um, it's uh, it's it's alleged that he it was multiple times yeah. over a, maybe a month and a half period. Yeah. Um, this is a busy guy. This is not yeah. a guy who was just you know. <laughs> right. So so he took this seriously. Yeah, he took it very seriously, and and he he wrote an, a, a script that said keep grabbing dot pie, which basically just grabbed one article, took it down, and stored it, and then just grabbed the next article. It was, it, it's a, a lot of these kind of hacking cases fit this similar uh, yeah. kind of script crawler mode where um, it, when they're scraping a database, it's just one, the, the number at the end of the article just is increased every yeah. single time. So it's, just, it's relatively easy to write a script. Some of these things come, you know, come prepackaged. It's not, yeah. even, not even writing it from scratch. So to your Thoreau quote, yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, he decided that JSTOR it was just so outrageous that he was, we don't know what he was planning on doing about it, but mm -hmm. he decided to do something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, th this is what's puzzling, and I think it does speak to that, that sort of question that an activist might have uh, as to where to transgress the law or to work within the system. And, and this is where that Thoreau quote, I think, becomes particularly kind of sharp. What do you, what do, you do when you're confronted with something that you see as an unjust law? And so he had he was in possession of 4.7 million journal articles when he was arrested. He didn't he didn't dump them, right? Uh, he didn't do anything with them as far as it was just on a hard drive. And this was not a mountain of cocaine on the right. back of a, you know, <laughs> right. a forklift. That's yeah. right. Right. It's 4.7 million journal articles right. on so, a hard drive. And yeah. it's it's actually very difficult to understand. Well, okay, if from the prosecutors, well, how, how what are we going to prosecute here? They identified that he was on the network several different times, and he and they kicked him off, and they routed he routed around it, and um, they ultimately figured out that he had accessed um, in in one of these kind of workarounds. He actually entered an MIT closet and plugged a computer in that was downloading these articles directly, not from the Wi-Fi wi or anything, just yeah. directly from the servers, and uh, they found out he was in there, um, and they uh, they bugged it, and they they put a surveillance camera in there. And they basically created a sting operation of sorts. I mean, uh, and they didn't stop the downloading, right? This is a significant fact. Like, they didn't say, this is dangerous. They realized they wanted to catch the person. They wanted to catch him coming back. So they let the downloading continue. Did they know who it was? That, that, At that point, when they decided to bug the closet, I mean, did they have a sense of who it was? I, I, have, I don't have evidence no. that they knew it was him. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not sure. They, they knew this person was being persistent. And uh, and so, so they, they set up this sting operation, and then once they had him on camera, they they uh, they sent the police after him. Cambridge police went after him, um, chased him down, threw him on the ground, arrested him. And this is a guy who was a you know young guy, physically slight, not a guy who was you know he was a guy who was intellectually aggressive and yeah. combative, but he was not a guy who was used to being a physical threat. No, you know, thrown on the ground by the cops. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, uh, he was on his bike. Uh, and they, they chased him down, and um, they threw him on the ground. His uh, father said that, that Aaron had told him that he wasn't aware that these were police, didn't know what was going on, uh, apparently undercover. Um, so um, they put him in, there's a point where he put him in solitary confinement, um, where they, uh, you know, they didn't know what was going on for a long time. They were, I think they were trying to intimidate him a little bit. So, um, yeah. So that's that's essentially how he how he was arrested. So you studied hackers mm -hmm. closely in yeah. your previous film, and this is a world that you know very well. And uh, you know, so this was MIT. Yeah. Um, Aaron Swartz was a very well-known figure. There were lots of different ways this case could have been handled. Yeah. How was it handled? Yeah, I mean, I think I, th well, I think when you think about MIT's role, uh, it's very puzzling. It's certainly puzzling to anybody who um, has dealt with MIT in any, any real way. Certainly a lot of uh, alumni and students and faculty were really puzzled by MIT's role in this. I mean, MIT traditionally has encouraged uh, kind of pushing the boundaries a little bit, especially tech, you know, technological boundaries, uh, encouraged you know, a little transgression in order to sort of come up with new ideas. I mean, it's kind of at the core of who they are. And so uh, to, to what they did in this case is that they took um, what they called a neutral position, right? In other words, uh, it's, this is their take on it. They say, we, we, we didn't, we're not going to do anything here. We're going to try to, um, we're not going to come down on anybody's side. We're just going to play a neutral, have this kind of neutral stance, which was problematic um, uh, because, first of all, they missed a, a really good opportunity to, to be a leader to say, you know, what, what is this activity? What did he do? Is this really bad? 
Um, and how bad is it, right? The, the, uh, the, department, uh, the, the prosecutor's office put a press release out that said 35 years in prison and a $1 million fine. Um, it was a four count indictment that later was um, uh, increased to 13 counts, 13 felonies. And they seemed very intent on, on, on getting him for a felony, making a felon out of him. So MIT missed a very a huge opportunity for Could some MIT sort of clarity. Could MIT have prevented that from happening? Could MIT have intervened well, with the I prosecutors? Th it's hard to know, but there's certainly, what's, what's interesting is JSTOR, who's technically the victim of the case uh, in this, um, this so-called crime, uh, backed out. And, um, you know, the, the Aaron's lawyer at the time said, look, it's, it wasn't a friendly, they weren't our friends, but they realized pretty soon that they hadn't, no, no, no real damage had happened to them, that they didn't want to pursue this case. This wasn't something that they wanted to push forward. So they, they withdrew all charges. And yet the case moves, moves on. Uh, Relentless doesn't skip a beat. So why, why is that? And MIT at that point is the only person supplying evidence that they're the only people, they're the only people left. And the they're mix. claiming to be neutral. And they're claiming yeah. to be neutral. And by the way, they're sharing lots of information. This, according to Aaron's lawyers, from their perspective, they're sharing lots of sharing lots of information with the prosecutors and not so much with the defense team. And so um, their, their lawyers feel like they haven't they haven't been treated fairly. What exactly was the crime? Was it breaking and entering? Well, it, okay. So you might think like, here's all these academic journal articles. Um, maybe he's violating copyright of some sort, right? None of those 13 charges were copyright charges. They were all about access. Did he have access to the database? And, um, and that's a big, a big, that's important because a lot of computer crimes, lots of hackers, um, including notable cases like Weave and others, have been all about this law, the CFAA, right? The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is all about unauthorized access to a computer. So the heart of Aaron's charges were about did he have access to that database or not. And so it's clear that he had access to the, as I explained earlier, it's clear that he had access to MIT. It's clear from MIT he had access to JSTOR. But uh, so, so where does this charge of unauthorized access happen? And the truth is we don't know what the case would have been because it never went to trial. We don't know what the prosecutor's case, what they would have tried to, what they would have said. But it seems to be that, that when they kicked him off, right, and he routed around it, it was pretty obvious that they didn't want to have access, that they didn't want him to have access. They kicked him off the network. They shut down uh, the uh, MIT's access to JSTOR for a brief moment. And he kept routing around that. So I, it seems as though the heart of the case would have been, obviously, they didn't want him to have access because they were actively trying to, and he was actively trying to get around it. Right. That seems like it would have been the heart of the case, but we actually don't really know. I mean, we don't, uh, I, I tried to talk to the prosecutors, and they, they refused to talk, I mean, they've refused to talk to everybody about this. But it does seem as though the, he, he was being intimidated. Uh, what was the nightmare scenario? I mean, what did he fear would happen in the worst case? I think that, I think that there's, that the answer to that question is on a, a lots of different levels. I think that um, it seems to me. Well, Qu Quinn Norton says in the film that he he really had a Quinn sense. Quinn Norton, who is his partner, who was his uh, a girl a girlfriend, yeah, yeah, at, yeah. at the time of his arrest. Um, she says that he um, that he had really a, a, a real kind of desire to be involved in politics and and to have, you know, they, he, she tells a story that they were walking by the White House one day when in the middle of all of this kind of. Um, uh, this, this trouble that he was in. And they look at the White House and he says kind of wistfully, you know, they don't let felons work there. So you could tell he was, he was thinking like about, again, working with kind of within the system, trying to bring his skills and talents into this system. Um, and I think that, the, you know, living with a felon takes you out of that equation, you know? You can't even vote in some states if you're a felon. So, um, so I think that was a, a big concern of his. I think there was a physical concern that, of being in prison, losing his freedom, uh, that sort of thing. And I, and, I don't, and I also don't think that he believed what he did was wrong. So I think there so was just a, the simple fact that it felt unjust to him just really yeah. just drove him to destruction. Yeah. yeah, I think so. I, I mean, he had plenty of opportunities to take a plea. Um, and uh, so there were many people eager to help him with his legal defense as well, it seems. It was, although, although again, he was reluctant to ask for help. 
he was reluctant to ask for money or, you know, and it, it completely exhausted him financially and his family, you know, um, uh, you know, even more given by his family. Um, I think it was just, it was just beginning to kind of dominate his life. And, and, uh, and towards the end, you know, uh, I mean, he ended up committing suicide on the two year, roughly the two year anniversary of his arrest. And it was heading towards a trial. So, you know, the final pleas had been, uh, had, had, he had not taken any of the pleas and, and they decided it was gonna go to trial. Aaron Swartz, did he die in vain? Did he die in vain? I mean, his legacy, you mean? Like what, uh, I think that, um, you know, there, there was a big wave of anger and frustration that happened right after he died. And a lot of people, including people that didn't know him, really responded to his story. And so when you look back, what, it, what do we, if, if you think about his legacy, if you think about where, what this story means, um, you know, if you, you can look at, look at the, the way some of his early work kind of lives on, you know, the, the technical stuff that we talked about, the early kind of free culture internet stuff. Um, you, can, you can look at some of his social organizing um, work that, that, that definitely lives on in a very real way. He created a thing called Victory Kit, which um, some uh, organizations are using to increase their kind of mailing lists, to uh, fine tune their mailing lists to get the, the right message. Um, those, are, those are tools that are still being developed, open source tools that are, that are um, very, very useful for some people. I think his efforts during the Stop Online Piracy yeah. Act debate uh, you know, really raised a tremendous amount of awareness mm -hmm. about these issues and in inspired a lot of people yeah, to, yeah. Uh, to become engaged with them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it lives on in other ways, like um, Secure Drop is another example. Secure Drop is something he was working on with Kevin Paulson from Wired at the time of his death. Um, that was essentially like a kind of WikiLeaks style Dropbox that I individual news organizations can have so that people can give them um, documents or communicate with them anonymously to protect those sources. Um, very, obviously very useful uh, and, and, and relevant kind of tool for, for modern times. Um, so that's being developed by Freedom of the Press Foundation. They're continuing that development. But I think there's also, I mean, his story, and I hope the film helps with this a little, uh, that his story lives on in the sense that, you know, our criminal justice system has problems. It's broken. And, um, you know, the, the plea bargaining system, the, the fact that 97% of the people in our criminal justice system uh, take a plea, um, only 3% go to trial. It's kind of absurd to think. 97% of the people in our criminal justice system are guilty. We think about our criminal justice system as, as having an adversarial component, yeah. yet it seems as though prosecutors have superpowers. They have so much leverage. Completely they right. kind of rack up so many charges to just give them that leverage. Yeah. Uh, and, and it seems that you know, Aaron's case, for a lot of people who, a lot of his friends and allies who didn't necessarily have that kind of direct experience in the criminal justice system, it, it's, it seemed to have... Uh, woken up a lot of people absolutely. to some of its worst qualities. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And Aaron was this kind of white, I Ivy League educated young man, you know, and, and, and yet this kind of, these kind of problems are, I think it did wake up a lot of his, commu you know, his community, uh, but of course it is kind of um, business as usual in lots of communities. Um, you know, it's a problem. We've given prosecutors enormous power. Uh, and and they, they're able to leverage this pressure against people that don't actually understand their rights or don't, may, not be able, may not even afford to participate in this system. It's not, it's not what we think of. Aaron think was of someone justice. who understood his rights, uh, someone who could have, had he chosen to do so, uh, brought a lot of resources to his disposal, yeah. and he uh, you know, faced this. And even he, yeah. Yeah, he had money to throw at this problem, and, and a lot of people don't. And he found himself overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have a huge problem. I mean, we have one example of this is like public defenders in this country, right? We don't actually have public defenders in all 50 states in this country. There's not even a public defender system in all 50 states in America. That surprises people. So if you, you know, we, I think we assume that like even if you don't have money, you'll get somebody appointed to you. That's not necessarily true. And a lot of times public defenders are way overtaxed, right? They see 500 cases in a year. So that means they see a defendant 20 minutes before they, cop, they, they take a plea. And when the deck is so stacked against them, I mean, to some degree, there's a transactional dimension. I mean, you win some, you lose some, yeah. you compromise and you cut corners. Right. So I also want to ask you about the film. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, you raised funds for the film on Kickstarter. Yeah. It seems like you got a very enthusiastic response. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's amazing. I think it's one of the great things about Kickstarter is the, is the kind of community it develops. Um, I think it's rare for a film to raise it, its entire budget on Kickstarter. I, my initial plan was to do two Kickstarter campaigns, and I realized from just the amount of work that goes into a Kickstarter yeah. campaign, it was my first one, I didn't really know, um, uh, that we were really going to probably just one was going to be, you know, because it, it takes you away from actually building the film and making the film. Um, but such a wonderful kind of outpouring of support uh, that, from people uh, that really got us going. Um, and, uh, yeah, and I think that's even more than the budget that you raise. It's that, that community aspect, that, that instant kind of audience of people that care about the film um, is really what is great. I mean, it gives you a sense of responsibility as a filmmaker. Like, How can we watch the film? Uh, the film comes out June 27th uh, in theaters across the United States. It's uh, currently we're at 20, 25 theaters or something across the United States. And same day, um, video on demand. Uh, so in, in, in almost any place you want to watch it, you can probably get it. Uh, iTunes, uh, even things like Xbox and PlayStation, um, Roku, even ways that I don't watch films. <laughs> you can, that, that we have those. And uh, we also are doing something that, um, that was we thought a lot about. Um, that 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 kept in the spirit of Aaron, who was the architect of Creative Commons. We we are through Vimeo doing a, a DRM-free version that that is a non-commercial share-alike version. That's exactly in the spirit of what Aaron hopefully. Would that's want. really neat. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much, Brian. Yeah. Thank you very much.